Yeah, I'm Ricky Martin. I'm the, the geospatial lead at the RLA. Although there is a tiny cartographer trying to break out, uh, although some might dispute that based on the colours I was trying to use yesterday in the in the hackathon. So I've still got quite a bit to learn with that. Um, and based on that, I do want to say a big thanks to you guys, uh, those in the room who produce um, blogs or tutorials with um, tips and tricks. That's really appreciated. I'm going to talk to you today about how the RNLI, how we use geospatial data across the whole of the uh, across the whole of the organisation to help aid major decision making and hopefully save some lives at the same time. So, for those of you who don't know who the RNLI are or what we do, it should be a very quick video. So the RNLI, or the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, we are a charity that saves lives at sea, and at the last count, it's been over uh, 144,000. We, uh, we were set up in 1824, which actually makes next year our 200 year anniversary. And we were hoping, and I'm looking at Paul and Jess and the, uh, these guys over there, that we might be doing a collaboration with, with OS. Um, so look out for that next year, fingers crossed. We've got 238 lifeboat stations, and they're scattered across the whole of the British Isles. And last season, we lifeguarded on 242 beaches. Some key stats or some key uh, bits of information. Uh, we are a charity, and we choose to be a charity, so we're not government-based. We are not the Coast Guard, although a lot of people think we are the Coast Guard, but they do task us for the majority of all of our jobs. Uh, and we rely on the dedication and support of, of thousands um, of, of volunteers and supporters there. So what I'm going to do is talk to you very quickly about the team that are sitting and then go into these examples. So we updated our geospatial strategy at the start of this year. We've now got six out of the seven major departments in the organization using GIS or geospatial data. Uh, and so the examples will cover stats and mapping, applications, projects, and detailed analysis. We'll finish off looking at what we're going to try and do in the future, and then we'll hopefully have some time for some questions at the end. So if everyone's ready, just jump on board. You guys were lucky in the front row. I was going to make that 4D and squirt some water around. <laughs> but you're safe. <laughs> so back in 2018, the organization uh, made uh, turned around and became a uh, evidence-led decision-making organization. I sit within the analysis and data science team, and that sits within the uh, insights technology and strategy directorate. So you can kind of see by those terminology that's we're geared up for getting data, for processing it, and acting on that information. It's a pretty small team. There's myself as a geospatial lead. We have two data scientists, three coast risk analysts, and one business information analyst. What we're trying to do is get timely and accurate information out across the whole organization. That could be as maps, as charts, dashboards, interactive applications, depending on what the customer wants. Um, we're also looking at what's going on today, as well as looking at future risk and change. And we've won an award at the start of this year. So this is the British Data Awards. We won Best Not-for-Profit. And that's kind of covering where we've come from. So since where we've come from since 2018, to where we are now and to where we're going. So we know we're not at the finish line, but hopefully this shows that we're going in the, in the right direction. So we'll kick off with some of our more static and some mapping examples. First up, these are our operational life-saving statistic dashboards. 
Just try send that out for a couple of beers. These have got um, anybody can access these across the organization. So we could have crew members or media of the comms team. Anyone can come along uh, and get this. There's four things lifeboats, which is what you've got on the screen here, lifeguards, uh, fatalities, and water safety. What we're doing in this one is we're collecting as much information as we can about a shout. So whenever we go out, we'll collect where we're going, what we got up to, what we did. But we also join it with a lot of external data as well. So you can kind of see in this bottom left-hand corner here, we also collect uh, wind speed, wind direction, water temperature. So we can try and get as much information as we possibly can. And so we can start understanding why things are happening where they are um, and what the, what the main causes are. And most importantly, we've got a map in the bottom left-hand corner there, so people can look at this data spatially at the same time. So this is an example um, of some of our static maps. Uh, this is So we're gonna jump across, this is in our water safety team. Their job is to get key water safety messages out to, to members of the public. This request was they wanted to know what educational establishments were in the North and East region. Uh, establishments could be uh, nurseries, schools, colleges, universities. What they wanted to do was know which of these establishments are within 10 miles of, uh, of one of our stations, and then what was a general um, uh, layout density of them across the whole of the region. What they're doing is we've got loads of initiatives of you can meet a lifeguard, um, workshops, seminars, presentations. So based on the type of audience that we've got, we'll dedicate what kind of resource that we're going to use at that establishment. We've now made this a bit more of an interactive map so the team can come in and actually record which establishment they've been to, what they did, do they need to go back in a couple of years' time, what other establishments they need to go to. So this is just one example of one of the static maps that we produce. We are jumping across now to our, this is our fundraising uh, team. Uh, this was um, it's a really quick and a really simple map, but it came as a request from one of our donors who has brilliantly funded one of our relief boats. So the relief boat has been situated in three stations in the southwest. And brilliantly, if you can see on the screen here under the live save, it's gone towards saving three people's lives. Uh, lives. What's really cool is, like I say, it's a really quick, it's a really simple map, but really effective to go to a donor. Thanks so much for the money you've contributed. This is how you're helping the organization. It's a really quick, really simple, but hopefully really effective. So these are more static. What we're trying to do is get a lot more into interactive applications, self-serve, get people to come and get the information that, that they require. So first up, we're coming across this into our ops room. Um, so whenever we get tasked, it will, uh, the call will come through from the Coast Guard into our ops room, and they can assess what the resources are and can we turn out for it. I'm going to talk to you about the life saving service status map, and this is this, on this cool monitor. Definitely need to get one of these at home uh, at the very bottom here. But I wanted to highlight as well, you can kind of see in the top left-hand corner, we've got Windy, uh, which is a climate. It's got the, the weather, the wind conditions on there. And you've got the map on the right-hand side as well. So you can kind of just see how much geospatial information is being used in the control room when it comes to turning out on one of the boats. So this is our life saving service status map. It's an almost real-time view of the status of our stations and where our fleets are. Uh, stations could be off duty for environmental, personnel, or asset um, reasons. Uh, and also on here, we can see who's been turned out for a job. So you can see in the blue here, we've got a couple of stations who are out on a shelf right now. So we'll zo zoomed in over Plymouth. We can see the track of the, we can see the boat. We can see the track that they're taken. We can get additional information as well. So for example, I mentioned about the environmental reasons We've got three stations here due to the tide can't actually turn out at the moment. So they've got that information there for them. Coming across, we've got our AIS data, which I know some of you guys are using in the room. This is a tracker on every single one of our boats. So we've got the college down in pools. You can kind of see the big concentration of boats up there. We've then got the tracks for every single uh, location of where the boat went to up to the last seven days. So we can filter that information we can click on these points and you'll get that wind, tide, sea temperature information as well. So we've got that really big picture about what's going on at, at each one of our shouts. And we can join the two up together. We can look at what's going on in Plymouth 
on the left hand side. And then we can come across and look at what did Humber get up to last week? So we can compare the two bits of data at the at the same time. We'll come across to this is our lifeguards. Um, this is our lifeguard over, uh, services overview app. And this is focusing on beach safety assessment. So every year we have to, um, every season and every five years, we have to update uh, our beach safety assessments. They cover all the major risks along a beach and then what are we doing to mitigate those, those risks? If anyone remembers the, the bomb of drownings at the start of the year, this was the very first document requested by an external organization. So it's really important that we, that we keep them up to date. Last year, we made that decision that we're going to bring these. These are all being uh, looked after regionally, and we decided we want to bring them in in a central location. So we've been using the GIS system to keep a track of which of those reports are, are up to date, which are close to expiring, uh, and which have expired. So brilliantly, on this day, you can see none have actually expired, but we have got a few here which are coming up to expire within three months. So we can just keep a check, we can click on this, keep a check, and go and chase those locations to make sure they can update their reports. But we've also got external data. So this is our beach characteristic data sets. This is really useful that we could start using, um, we can start looking at maybe different types of beaches or similar types of beaches in different locations. So can we do something that we're carrying out on a beach down in Cornwall? Can we replicate that to a beach up maybe in the northeast and look and see if we can reduce the risk in two different locations. And we're then we're just building this application up. We're now coming to adding more information. So we've got lifeguard uh, images coming on here. So we've got a picture at the front, left, right, and the back of the lifeguard unit. So all of a sudden, we've now got the lifeguards have got information about their beach safety assessments, uh, the beach characteristics images as well, they're building up insight about what the risk is at their, at their uh, particular location. This is uh, only available, we only produced this this year, so it's only been coming out for the last couple of months and it's gone down really well. You can kind of see the, the number of layers that we're adding to this. So we're adding more and more to it uh, as we go and it is, it's really nice to see how well the life guys are, are taking this on board. So we'll come across to detailed analysis. And we're going right to the very top with this one. Uh, these are our life saving effect review documents and actually they're quite confidential. So I've only stripped out those bits that have got a map on there or some geospatial data in it. Um, this goes right up to our senior leadership team and our exec board. Uh, and what they're doing is looking at the overall effectiveness of all of our stations and there'll be individual stations at a time. So what it's doing is looking at the, the station in its current state, looking at any future issues with it and highlighting do we need to make any um, any changes uh, at that at that station what this means is it's making sure we've got the right resources in the right places um, so we're spending the money wisely so it's pretty cool that this is going now i mentioned we've got this quite small team it's pretty cool that this is going right to that top level and decisions have been made hopefully that we're using the resources in, in the right way across the organization uh, using this type of uh, analysis We'll cautiously talk about climate analysis after Danny's comment earlier on about this. Uh, but we've got an app looking at climate change and the impact that it's having on us. We focused on coastal flooding to start off with. Uh, we want to look at coastal flooding, pluvial and fluvial within a set distance of our stations and to work out what impact that they were going to have uh, on those areas. Uh, we, this was looking at a 2050 medium uh, emission scenario. Uh, we looked in, so we've got our own stats linked into this as well. Um, so as you move around this application, the stats will change per station. So you can kind of see what the impact would, would be at, at each station. And if you want to, you can compare stations against each other. So we can click on this um, flooding graphs in the bottom corner. And we can start comparing those stations that are most impacted by, by fluvial, by fluvial or by tidal, tidal flooding. But what we realized is it's not just coastal flooding that's impacting us, it is the climate overall. And so brilliantly, we've, there's a lot of open data out there, especially by the Met Office. When you're looking at, um, we've got annual and predicted rainfall. 
we've got sea level change, we've got temperatures, uh, temperature change. Organizations like the, the National Trust have done a load of climate change analysis uh, and we're using their storm flood future uh, information. So this application, this is being used by our estates team and our strategic development team. And similar to the, the previous example, they're using this to make sure we've got the right resources in the right places. So if we can identify now that we've actually got a station at risk of coastal flooding, can we move it? And if so, where can we move it to? Um, and again, this has only come about the last couple of months, still a little bit of work in progress, uh, but really cool to kind of see that we're going to hopefully make some major decisions that are going to come from using this kind of geospatial data. This I'm quite excited by. Uh, this is uh, from our data science team. Um, this is looking at, so it had lifeguard data in it, but we could chuck anything. We could be looking at our fatalities. We could be looking at the, the lifeguard information, anything at all. This one was looking at the uh, environmental and temporal factors of what makes an instant high risk. There's a load of geospatial data in this. Uh, so we're chucking loads of different permutations against each other and trying to work out what factors are are most relevant to us. Fully appreciate there's no maps in this, and it's just a lot of text and a lot of diagrams, but I wanted to kind of show how much analysis is, is going on uh, with this kind of information. So we will, going forward, we will get maps in there. We will get better visualizations. We'll get less text in there. But it, we just wanted to kind of highlight, since 2018, now we're, we're collecting all this data. We can throw so much at it and try and work out what's going on. Um, so kind of really excited over the next couple of years where we're going um, with the data science team. You saw from the video, um, we're also working internationally at the moment. So we're working in uh, Bangladesh and Tanzania. Bangladesh, back in 2020, they released a report that unfortunately shows there's a massive increase in drowning in um, under fives. So we're working with the, the Children Need Institute and we're trying to target communities where we could uh, educate community members in water rescue and resuscitation. So we've highlighted which areas had, had the most drownings and we've then been kind of using the open data. This is using uh, the World Park for Population Density and Open Street Map and identifying those areas that have got high population and then high number of water features, your streams, your rivers, your lakes. So we're then going to target those areas. We're going to go over, we're going to visit them, we're going to carry out more surveys to really understand what what the issues have been in those particular areas, what, what have been the, the reasons why the drownings have occurred. We'll be using GIS to do that and hopefully we'll be able to get a lot more analysis, a lot more insights and really try and understand and see if we can try and help prevent future drowning uh, going forward. On the right hand side, we've got Tanzania uh, and this is search and rescue, so it's pretty cool that the search and rescue guys um, at the back there. This is the local fishing, uh, or the, the fishing communities over there have a few issues when it comes to doing search and rescue. The, the old methods they were using were just going off in different directions and not systematically covering. So you can kind of see the, in the top right, the up and down methods, what you would use for search and rescue. So we've designed this, this template at the very bottom where we, we've got it gridded up. We've got an area where you could draw in your wind direction, wind speed, the wind current. You could laminate that and then people could draw over the top of where the search compassion needs to be. They could give grid scales to different people. Uh, so this is just an example. This is ongoing as well. I think the team are over there right now um, helping with the training. So it'd be great to get some feedback and see how well else we can take, take this forward. Uh, but just a couple of examples how we're working internationally at the same time. So where are we going in the future? For me, I want to better visualize our data or find new ways to visualize our data. This is using something called PIDEC. It's looking at our 2022 incident data. And it's trying to hopefully, for me, find these local hotspots that you would kind of lose if you just did that 2D um, looking down analysis. You can really pick up just a little local ones going on down here. Some of you may have seen this yesterday, uh, using the ARCs as well. Looks really cool. Uh, and we can color coordinate these if we wanted to based on different types of instance. And it's just trying to show our data in a slightly different way of, of can we identify new hotspots or try and identify areas where instance that we maybe didn't know by using traditional methods. So that's just one way that we want to try and just visualize our data in slightly different ways um, and get a bit more insight from there. Buzzword bingo. No presentation will be complete without all my AI. So we're involved as well. 
we've got these little cameras uh, on our lifeguard unit. So we, we had two in England over the last two years, and we've got, I think, nine uh, on some beaches in Northern Ireland this season. What it's doing is scanning the beach, taking photographs, stitching together, and counting how many people are in the water on the beach. Is there a rip current? Uh, is there a weather front coming in? Over time, we can start collecting that information and really start producing hotspot maps. So actually, everybody always sits on the beach here. We always put our flags up over here. There's always rip currents occurring over here. So the amount of insight, and imagine if you came to the beach, you could see that on a digital board and really start to understand why we put the flags up in a particular area because of the risk is always occurring over here. We could also make smart beaches. So we could have a number of beaches all in a row and actually have the risk score going up and going, actually, your risk score has increased. A rip's just occurred. You've got so many people on the beach down the road. You haven't, your score's decreased. Let's bring a lifeguard up. And so, you know, we could get smart beaches going forward. So hopefully, uh, this would be pretty cool going forward. This is, like I say, trialing at the moment. We'll hopefully get some good results out of this over the next year or so. And that's it. So before we turn around and head back to shore, I just want to say a big thank you uh, for listening. Appreciate, I've kind of jumped around a little bit, but I just wanted to show how we're using GIS and geospatial data across the whole of the organization. It's used you know, for, for analyzing our assets, for education, you know, loads of different ways. Um, so I hope that's been informative. Hope you've enjoyed that. Has anybody got any questions? Um, but so since the lockdowns are sort of real push towards um, the well-being benefits of not just green space but also blue space, a lot more wild swimming, designation of inland bathing waters, have you seen or do you see that having an impact on on yourselves operationally, but also in terms of your geospatial strategy? In terms of where we're an increase in those types of um We've got the, well, the biggest increase we have found is the middle aldi Audi paddle borders, um, which has been a massive increase. I think it's over 50% increase in call outs over the last two years um, of, of paddle borders. Um, that's been the main, the main one that we've, that we've noticed. Um, everyone else has kind of stays pretty calm. Because of, um, because of lockdown, you could actually still go out into the water. So we didn't see a massive Massive decrease. We did find, um, such a risk guys said this as well earlier on, self-harm is a massive problem that we've got. And we do notice that when you go through those periods of maybe the cost of living crisis um, or when you go through COVID and people can't see each other, we do notice an increase in those types of things. Um, but no, it's just the panel borders that cause us problems at the moment. <laughs> this isn't recorded, is it? Try to get in trouble for it. Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. I was, I was wondering about where the demand is coming from. So, this stuff. so, I think you guys and your teams are sitting around coming up with some really neat ideas for how to use geospatial data and then sort of preaching it to the rest of the organization. Or, or if the organization are uh, knocking on your door all the time and saying, we need more about this, we need more about that. No, it's a really good question. It's a bit of both. Um, it's almost at a slight, you can, we can do a slight demo of where we're going. This is what we've got. These are the tools. This is what you could do. But we are finding a lot more people now coming to us going, oh, we want to see our data like this. We want to see something else like that. So it's quite nice that I think with that educational piece, you know, it's not new to them. They understand what geospatial data is. They understand the insights that they can get from it. We are getting a lot more requests, but it is, we're trying to find that happy medium, making sure that actually, not the customers are always, always right. Uh, but making sure that actually uh, what they are, you know, what they are asking for is that the right method to do that could be displayed in a in a slightly different way. Um, so no, it's it's a pretty cool time to be there. Where we've got that kind of that people are now getting on board. Excuse the pun, but I'm running away with it. They're understanding what they can do with it, so it is uh, it is quite nice. At one time, the ordnance survey and hydrographic office produced a map, a blind map of the foreshore. And I'm just thinking of, of next year whether that sort of map would be useful to the RNLI have one that included the local land and the sea 
considering that most of the paddle board is started from land. Yeah, no, definitely. What I would say, as I've got the audience survey people in the room as well, um, <laughs> you saw from one of from, yeah, from one of the very first maps, we covered the whole of the British Isles. Ordnance survey is amazing, but for the UK. So a lot of the resources that we try and get, I try, I use OpenStreetMap quite a bit because it covers all of our operational area. Um, so if Ordnance Survey could get on much better with Osney um, and Ordnance Survey Northern Ireland and the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, and we could get one combined data set, that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, anything like that would be, would be really handy. Did anyone try and help? What is the service distance away someone would be from getting support? It's a good question, actually. We're um, we'll we're work in terms of distance outwards. We don't go past 100 nautical miles, um, and you've also got um, the national boundaries as well. So, for example, during the Channel, you've got that line in the middle where the French Coast Guard and we we would operate. Um, I don't know what the biggest distance is. is between between stations uh so it's something we we're, we're currently working on at, at the moment or on this note if the stations could we possibly nowadays have less stations because they've got faster boats you know and it will provide the same level of cover because we've got better equipment to do it so they're questions that we're tackling with at the moment and well, the reason why i ask you Mike, sorry every year about four surfers here in Russia. Um, and in one instance, one uh, server had his feet picking up. The only way to survive was to put a tourniquet on and go to shore and just go and drive under the pond. Ooh, it's been possible. So I'm, I'm sure it's not the same. But I'm just wondering, you know, yeah. if I was in trouble in the water and I was the worst area covered by your organisation, that how far away? Same in time, right? Expect some of the answers. No, it's a really good question because we don't we don't have a time. We used to have KPIs where we said we'd go, we'd have to get with them within 35 minutes. We then struggle with the fact that all of our we're volunteer crew. So we don't they don't all live exactly five minutes away from the station. You then started having car crashes as people would you know race into the station to try and to try and get out of there. So they scrapped the within 35 minutes call out time that went. So it's yeah, we've. It's a good question and it's a tricky one to answer. Is it? Yeah, that's kind of gone in the old days. But we'd like to think you won't be spending too long bobbing around in the water. Just wear a life jacket, float to live, and uh, you'll be all right. Yeah.